mm. that you like, but will you, is the quality is the problem with the quality? Because it, for us, it would be nice to see your face, but as, as you like. No, no, it's okay. It's just that um, I am very close to the computer because I confess, mm -hmm. I do not have a desk in this room, so I, <laughs> <laughs> as you probably can see, but it's, it's, it's okay. It's okay. I need to be close to the door because my internet connection is not great. And um, Okay, so uh, hi, everybody. Welcome back to Global Poisson after, after this break. So we start our sessions again. And maybe the first thing that I would like to do, I would like to, to thank uh, Anastasia and also Beatrice and Nikita who are absent today for this Junior Poisson event. Uh, it was a, a great three days from morning till evening. Uh, so thanks a lot. They gave all us, of us an example of how one should organize conferences. And also there were so many exciting talks. So it would be great certainly to, to do it again in some relatively near future. I don't know, Anastasia, whether probably now you're too tired to say yes, but think about it. Like in we're, we're planning, we're planning to do it again, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That 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 would be great. Uh, it's also interesting that now this window where you are, it says Nikita Nikolaev, right? It's a kind of fusion of personalities, is it? Yeah. Right. Okay, so, uh, so thanks a lot, kind of. Uh, that, that Thank you on, on behalf of all three organizers. Yeah, that was absolutely great and very well appreciated by the Poisson community. Uh, so uh, today, uh, so, Lisa, you, you're saying that uh, the, our quality is too, too, too low, that you propose to stop the video? Oh, I'm I, just saying that often, mm -hmm. often participants are asked to, I don't think in this seminar, sometimes participants are asked to not keep their video on because that might overload the system. Mm -hmm. yeah, but th th the speaker should be allowed to keep their video on. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Th Thank you, Lisa. I, I don't know. At the moment, I, I don't see any quality problem, but it's true. If you if you feel that you have some problem with connection, probably it's a good idea to stop the video. But a, a, as long as your connection is good, I think we can keep the video. And it would be nice for us to see the faces. So uh, today, we're very happy to have Silvia Sabatini as our first speaker of this term. And her title is Some Topological Properties of Monotone Complexity One Spaces. Uh, Sylvia, I give you the floor. Thank you so much. So uh, yeah, as I said, uh, this is my first day of work and there couldn't be anything nicer than giving a talk. So I'm really happy to, to give this talk. So this is based on um, two, well, it's based on one preprint and one paper that has been written. So the one with Daniele Sepp is already out. Um, it's called Ontopological Properties of Positive Complexity in One Spaces. And uh, we are preparing this other paper with my student, Isabel Charton, who should also be in the audience, and Daniele, who should also be in the audience. And I will mostly talk about the first one, but I will give some hint at uh, what is going to be written in the, in the second paper. So let me start. Um, so let me first define the objects that I'm going to talk about. So M omega is a compact symplectic manifold of dimension 2n, so far so good. J is an almost complex structure which is compatible with omega, so that means that when you twist omega with J on the second factor, you get a Riemannian metric. So with respect to J, of course, one can consider the first chain class or the churn classes of the tangent bundle with respect to this almost complex structure. But since the set of such structures is contractible, we can actually associate chain classes directly to omega. So I will consider the first chain class of the tangent bundle of M with respect to omega. And the condition of being monotone or positive monotone is very easy to state. Uh, we will say that a symplectic manifold is called a positive monotone. If the first chain class is a positive or not, depending on whether you drop the positive uh, or not, is a positive multiple of the class of the symplectic form. 
So in the rest of this talk, we will be indeed only concerned with positive monoton symplectic manifolds because for the category of spaces to which I will restrict, um, every monoton such space will be automatically positive monoton. So that's just, um, that's why we are concerned mostly with these, with this, um, with these spaces. And so positive monoton symplectic manifolds are positive in the following sense. So this positivity condition is really strong because if you take the first chain class and you integrate it over any symplectic surface embedded in M, then the result should be positive, right? So this is really a positivity condition that actually comes from algebraic geometry. So from Fano varieties. So for Fano varieties, how this, um, so how Fano varieties are defined is in the following way. So you have a smooth complex variety Y in such a way that the anti-canonical line bundle on Y, which is usually uh, denoted by minus KY. So KY is the determinant line bundle of the cotangent bundle. You want this line bundle to be ample. So what does it mean to be ample? It means that there exists an embedding of Y into CPN, which makes it a projective variety and a k large enough in such a way that the kth tensor power of l is the pullback of o1 on cpn okay so now you notice that the first chain class of o1 is um is a multiple of the first chain class of the tangent bundle to cpn and now if you endow y with the pullback of the fubini study form so now you consider the following fact, you consider the fact that the first chain class of the tangent bundle to CPN is a multiple of the class of the Fubini study form. So when you pull everything back, what you obtain is that Y is automatically positive monotone, okay? So, so this is where the- um, so, so, Sorry, Celia, and for CPN, this is true simply because there uh, in H2, there is nothing else, right? Everything sure. is- Yeah, of course. Yeah, that's kind of trivially true. Yes. I mean, trivially, I don't know. Positivity, maybe yeah. not trivially, but-, but uh, Yes, 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 yes. Correct, correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, you still need to prove that the, the, the constant of the constant is positive, right? So that, that would be the only thing to prove that the first chain class is a positive multiple of the class of the Fubini study form. And then when you, when you do all this pullback, uh, you maintain the, the positivity for, for Y. Um, yeah, so there are a couple of important facts about fun varieties, and it is that they are all simply connected and their top genus is equal to one. So the top genus is, well, it's, it's defined in, in, in many ways, but um, one way, the, the original way maybe it was defined is, as the other characteristic of, um, of the cohomology with sheaf given by the structure sheaf. But using the Atiyah Singer theorem, one can see that this thought genus can actually be computing using the churn classes of the manifold. For instance, if the dimension, the complex dimension of Y is equal to one, so you just have um, a real surface, then the thought genus is the integral of the C1 divided by two over Y. And these are other two examples of how the top genus looks like, okay? And so these properties are enjoyed by Fano varieties. And so there is a very natural question that one can ask, which is that when is a positive monotone symplectic manifold diffeomorphic to a Fano variety, right? Because it's always kind of, um, well, it's not always hard, but given the symplectic and killer category, the more you put hypothesis on this additional hypothesis on the manifolds and the more hard, the harder it is to tell whether these are different categories or not, okay? Sorry, one more stupid question. So is it true part of this question is whether M is a complex manifold, right? That too, yes, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Right, right, so, Right, so let's see. So let's see what is known. 
So in dimension two and four, well, dimension two is kind of trivial, but in dimension four, this is a theorem of Macduff, uh, Gromov and Taubes. And so it is always true. But there are already counterexamples starting from dimension 12. And these were constructed by Fine and Panov quite recently based on work of Resnikov. And I would also like to say that in the dimensions in between, pretty much uh, very little, very little is known. So, so the question is, so the, 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 this question seems to be quite hard to tackle like in full generality. So, um, you know, it makes sense to start asking yourself, you know, what if you add some additional hypotheses, for instance, what if M omega set has some sort of symmetries? And by symmetries, what I will mean is the existence of at least a torus action. So T is a compact torus of dimension D. And we want it to act on M in a Hamiltonian way. So this definition should be um, known to everyone. So there exists a moment map that describes the action. So for notation, I will introduce it. So it's a map from M to the dual of the Lie algebra, which is T invariant and such that for every element of the Lie algebra, whenever you pair, um, you contract omega with the vector field associated to Xi, this form is closed and you require it to be exact for every Xi and the moment map just gives you the primitive for every Xi. So this will be the Xi component of the moment map and this is the pairing between the dual of the Lie algebra and the Lie algebra. So now for a Hamiltonian T space, we will just mean this quadruple with M omega, the torus specified and the moment map where the action is effective. So we will always assume that the action is indeed effective. And the complexity of this quadruple is given by the dimension of M divided by two minus the dimension of the torus. So for these Hamiltonian spaces, it's pretty easy to see that the tangent spaces to the orbits are isotropic which means that this complexity is always a number that is greater or equal than zero. And it's called complexity, of course, because the lower it is, the smaller it is, the more symmetry the, the manifold has. So complexity zero Hamiltonian spaces are nothing else but the so-called symplectic toric manifolds. And you have the largest possible torus, uh, dimension of the torus acting on the manifold. So just half the dimension of the manifold. And for these spaces, I would like to say that the previous conjecture is for various reasons true. So they are all um, equivalently symplectomorphic to Fano varieties endowed with a toric, so as you start to the N action. So that is true. But the conjecture of Fine and Panoff uh, goes in a slightly different di direction. So the conjecture that every positive monotone Hamiltonian has one space of dimension six, so this would be complexity two, right? Because it's three minus one. They conjecture that all such spaces are diffeomorphic to Fano threefolds. And from 2010, the first uh, results in this direction are due to Lindsay, who is a student, was a student of Pano. Um, and they prove that indeed there is some evidence that this conjecture is true because they prove that every positive monotone Hamiltonian has one space of dimension six is simply connected and has tau genus equal to one, which are exactly properties enjoyed by Fano varieties. Okay. But what Daniele and I did was we went somehow in a different direction. So instead of uh, considering low dimensions and relatively small uh, torus symmetries, why not consider every dimension, but instead of considering the nicest possible action for which we know already this uh, question was true, you consider just you know, one case less. So what we prove is indeed that if you have this Hamiltonian T space, which is positive monotone and it is complexity one, then M is simply connected, it's Todd genus is one, and also it's Todd, uh, it's odd Betty numbers vanish. So this is what we managed to prove. So somehow this goes in the direction of proving that all such spaces are at least diffeomorphic to Fano varieties 
And one can, of course, refine this question in various ways, right? Because you can say, you know, are they equivalently symplectomorphic to Fano varieties in, endowed with a certain C star to the N minus one action and, and stuff like that. Uh, but the first thing that we asked ourselves was whether the result of Lindsay and Panov would hold in the, for this category of spaces. And then, together with Isabel and Daniele, Isabel Charton and Daniele Sepe, we specialized a bit to low dimensions. So dimension four, so this we don't really, we didn't find it written anywhere. We don't think maybe it's interesting, maybe not, but we proved like a first step which is that, so we proved something more. We proved that the circle action, so in dimension, sorry, in dimension four, complexity one means that the torus is of dimension one, you just have a circle. And what we prove in this case is that the circle action always extends to a T2 action, so to a toric action. And this Hamiltonian S1 space is always S1 equivalently symplectomorphic to a Fano twofold with a holomorphic C star action. Okay. Yeah. To, to, just to make sure here, we always assume it's positive monotone, right? Positive. Yes, 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 positive monotone. Indeed, if you just assume monotone, th thanks for asking because I meant to say this and then I forgot. So for Hamiltonian T spaces, being monotone is equivalent to being positive monotone. Yeah, there is a computation in equivalent cohomology that allows you to say that this constant of monotonicity is always positive if you assume that it is monotone. Um, yes. So, and to prove this result, we just essentially use some, some standard facts um, from the classification of Carchon, uh, the classification of Hamiltonian S1 spaces by Carchon in dimension four. And in dimension six, so we're still complexity one, so the dimension of the torus is two. We prove that if uh, the Hamiltonian T space is tall, which means that the reduced spaces are always two-dimensional topological spaces. So the reduced spaces in, in the complexity one could be either points or punctured surfaces. And the tallness says that these are always punctured orbifold surfaces, okay? And in this case, we can prove that the T2 action always extends to a T3 action, just like in the dimension four case and that the space is equivalently, T2 equivalently symplectomorphic to a Fano threefold with a holomorphic C star two action. Moreover, there are just finitely many such examples, which goes very much into the mm, toric. Like it seems really that these tall complexity one spaces, they mimic sort of very much what happens for toric spaces because there are only a finitely, a finite number of isomorphism classes of smooth toric varieties in every dimension. And there seems to be some hint that the same claim is true in every dimension, but we are still investigating that question. This is, that, is a, that is a harder question. But okay, so what I would like to do is to give you a proof of this fact. So we will assume M omega T psi is a positive monotone complexity one space. We want to prove that it is simply connected, that genus is one, and also that it's odd Betty numbers vanish. So let me start with the proof of the simply connectedness and somehow the tot genus equal to one will follow from this. So this proof is a consequence of two theorems. One is a theorem of Huili that says that if you have uh, compact Hamiltonian T space, no assumption on monotonicity, positivity, nothing. Then for any alpha, for any value of the moment map, if you consider the reduced space at alpha, so this M alpha, so you consider psi minus one of alpha divided by the orbit, then these two, these two groups, the, the fundamental group of M is always isomorphic to the fundamental group of the reduced space. And this is a very useful theorem um, that we used together with this other result, which is really the key result to prove uh, the theorem that I mentioned before. So what I am going to prove, in fact, is that if you have positive monotone complexity in one space, then the connected components of the fixed point set are either points or spheres. 
and now I show you how these A and B, they imply the theorem that I mentioned before. Right, so how do A and B imply that pi one of M is trivial? So you take now a vertex of the image of the moment map. We know by the theorem of Atiyah and Guillem and Sternberg that if you consider the pre-image of this vertex, this must be a connected component of the fixed point set. And so now you consider the reduced space at this vertex, which is just going to be the action of T is trivial. So it is just going to be the pre-image of the vertex. And so now you're almost done because now you observe that the first, the fundamental group of M is by the theorem of Lee, the fundamental group of MV. So the fundamental group of the pre-image of V and by the theorem with Daniele, this is either the fundamental group of a point or a sphere. And so it is trivial, okay? So this is what we need to prove. So we, um, I will start with a series of observations. So the first one, I'm sure that everybody here knows it, but I want to recall it just you know, to set notation, is the local normal form or that sets like what the weights of the T action are. So it turns out that around P, around a fixed point, there always exists complex coordinates that what's at N and these alpha one, alpha N, they leave in the dual lattice and they are called the weights of the action at P such that, so when you consider the element in the Lie algebra that is given by exponentiating Xi, an element of the Lie algebra, acting on Z1, Zn, well, this is really the formula that gives you how the action looks like. So it is a rotation in each uh, direction, complex direction, and the speed of the rotation is dictated, if you want, by this alpha one, alpha n. Sylvia? Yeah. Uh, how is it now? Some of those alphas may be zero, right? Right, 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 yeah. Because I may not only have a point, I may have a fixed mm -hmm. component, right, mm -hmm. of, a, of, a, of a bigger dimension, exactly, yeah. I'm, I'm going to actually use your observation two minutes, maybe in the next slide. Um, so not only the action linearizes so nicely, but also the moment map. Yeah, so you have this linear model for the moment map, which is given by this formula. And this is very useful. Yeah, whenever we work locally, we always work with this, uh, with this model. And so now exactly as uh, I was on the same slide. So now you take a connected component of MT. And what I want to prove to you is that the dimension of a connected component of the fixed point set is always bounded above by twice the complexity. And this is a nice result. I mean, it's really easy to get, but uh, this is true without any monotonicity assumption. It's true for any Hamiltonian T-space. And the proof is really easy. And it is the following. So let me start with these inequality. Why is this inequality true? So now you need to follow me a second. So you have a fixed component, right? And exactly as Anton said, the weights corresponding to the lines that are in the tangent space to C, they must be zero because this, this is the action locally, okay? So now you consider the weights in the normal bundle. The, norm, the weights in the normal bundle, the number of these weights, so first of all, these weights, none of them is zero. And the number of these weights is exactly the complex rank of your normal bundle, okay? But now we're always assuming that the action is effective. And if you assume that the action is effective, it means that the R span of these weights must be exactly the whole dual of the Lie algebra. So that means that I must have at least the dimension T, so at least the dimension of the Lie algebra weights, okay? So this is, this is the inequality that follows from this argument. And now you manipulate it a bit and you see that this is exactly uh, the inequality that I wrote. Um, I don't know, at least on my screen, now when you try to single out those things, uh -huh. it, doesn't, it doesn't work very well because, uh -huh. yeah, that's, that's no good. Okay, I will not do it anymore. <laughs> yeah, could, could you take away those? Because now we don't see actually the things that you have there. Oh. I didn't. Well, at least I don't see. I don't know. Maybe it depends on the computer, but then, I doubt. We, we, yes, we just see some okay. page. That's better. Okay. Yeah. Now, now it's perfect. 
Yeah, okay. now we see it again. Thank you. Okay, sure. Okay, so, so far so good. So let's see. Okay, now suppose that you have the dimension of the fixed component is as large as it can be. So it's twice the complexity, okay? So it turns out that the image of this fixed component must be a vertex of the moment map. And why is this true? This is true because, because the moment map is open to its, into, onto its image. So let me see why, let me tell you why this is impossible. So suppose you are in dimension six. So the image of the moment map is two dimensional, yeah? You take now a fixed component that is as large as it can be. So complexity one means that C is a surface, okay? So in the normal bundle, you see exactly two weights, yeah? And these two weights, they must span the Lie algebra. So they must be independent. So now you map these two weights together with the image of C, and what you see is a cone like this. Yeah, this is the image of the surface, this point. But now the problem is that the moment map is open onto its image, and this map cannot be open, right? Because I can take an open neighborhood of the fixed component C, which is saturated with respect to the orbits, and I can map it onto uh, the dual of the Lie algebra, what I would see is like, is this section, this, this, this cone intersected with some two-dimensional open set, right? Like a, an open disc. So that's, that's, not, that's not open into the, you know, onto its image. So, so in this case, you, you just need to see a vertex. Psi of C is a vertex. So now more observations. So if there exists, a vertex in such a way that the pre-image of this vertex is just a point, then we would be just done, right? Because in this case, the theorem of Lie implies that the fundamental group is the fundamental group of the reduced space, which is in this case is a point, and so you have the simple connectedness. Um, so what we need to prove with Daniele is that in the complexity one case, if the pre-image of V is a surface for all the vertices V of Psi of M, this surface is a sphere, okay? So I will just assume now that all these pre-images are surfaces. And in fact, they will all have the same topological type in general. And we need to prove that they are all spheres. And to prove this, there is a fundamental tool, which is the doesen heckman density function. So this density function is the density function of the doesen heckman measure but it also has a, another um, characterization, if you want. It is the, so the decimal heckman uh, function, density function at alpha is the symplectic volume of the reduced space at alpha. Okay. Um, so, 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 sorry, but just, just a small question. Uh, that, that's uh, at, at some kind of smooth points, right? Yes, sure, yes, yeah. Uh, yes, otherwise you are, and, you are in problem. And your, your, your whatever vertices or whatever they are, they, at least at first sight, they don't look very smooth. The vertices? Yeah, right. I mean, that's, that's at some, some kind of uh, generic points. But the, at non-generic points, I don't quite know how, I mean, right? The no, sure, you are right. But for what we will need, all these reduced spaces for us, like it, you are completely right. So you need to divide the image of the moment map in chambers, sort of, right? And 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 like whenever whenever you have the smoothness of the reduced space, so this formula holds when you have a more complicated reduced space, which is like stratified. Um, yeah, I, I I don't have a clue, but for what I will need. Uh, it's enough, in fact, that this is the symplectic volume, that this, that this holds when you have a smooth point, when the reduced space is, is smooth. Okay, so when you have a neighborhood of alpha on which your fibers do not degenerate, on which your reduced spaces do not degenerate. We will see in a second how, uh, how I'm going to use it, okay? So, okay. 
So the first observation about this function is that its minimum is attained at a vertex of the moment map. And the reason why this is true is because Cho and Kim, they prove that the logarithm of the Dosima Heckman function is concave. And then you use the fact that the image of the moment map is convex. And so you have to have that the minimum is attained not only on the boundary, but really at a vertex of the moment map. And now, and now you take the surface that realizes the minimum of the, sorry, you take the surface in such a way that uh, it is obtained as the pre-image of the minimum of the doisenberg heckman function. And now I need a little bit of um, notation. So let me recall that, so let me, let me say this again. So you have in one direction, your action is fixing sigma. So in one direction, your weight is zero. And now you have, another n minus one weights that somehow you see in the image of the moment map, okay? And these are exactly the weights of the T action on the normal bundle to sigma. And now I consider the edges that go in the same direction of these weights in the image of the moment map. I think, yes, I have a picture. So suppose that this is the image of the moment map so these are my weights. V is actually um, is actually the, the minimum of the Dossermach-Heckman function. And these are the edges that go in the same direction as the alpha i. Silvia, yeah. sorry for asking lots of questions. But oh, no, no, it's good, it's good. I don't feel alone at least, <laughs> it's good. So I, I, I don't know, of course, we, we should encourage other participants to ask questions as well. Of course. Uh, but, but, but how is it, do I understand correctly normally if the dimension is high enough, the value of this minimum is zero, right? The Dusseldorf Heckman function vanishes at the corner normally, or, or what? No, because you may have at a corner, you may have like, you may have, a, you may always have a fixed surface. Okay. Right. So imagine like okay. you, uh, mm -hmm. imagine you take uh, a Delzan polytope that is given. Well, just take simply a product of like an n minus one. Okay. Uh, okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Cross cross beyond. Of course, if you have uh, if you have fixed points, right? If you have fixed points that realize the minimum, then of course you are zero. But I am assuming I am assuming that I only have fixed surfaces at the mm -hmm. bottom. Okay. 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 Thank you. Yeah, sure, sure. But let's say generically, yeah, it's more, well, I don't know if it makes sense, this statement, but there are lots of <laughs> manifolds with lots of fixed points, so. Okay, so, right. So let me just say that the action also helps you if you want to split the normal bundle into a direct sum of line bundles, each of them invariant under the T action. In fact, uh, it is really the weights that tell you what are the lines uh, which are acted on with weight alpha i. And those lines, they build up these bundles in which the normal bundle splits. And now what I want to consider is a pre-image of an edge, okay? So a picture will follow soon. So it turns out that this is a compact symplectic four dimensional submanifold of M with a Hamiltonian S1 action. So to visualize this, uh, let me just visualize, sorry, there is a lot of notation. Let me visualize this, yeah? So can you see my, this hand moving? Yes. Yeah, and it doesn't create problems, right? It does not. Oh, okay, good, good. Okay, so on this plane here, you see this is the image of the moment map. And what I am building up on top of the image of the moment map is the graph of the doisenberg heckman function. Yeah? So how does this graph look like? This is what I want to understand. It will be key to prove the main theorem. So how do I draw this graph? Well, over the point on which the doisenberg heckman function reaches the minimum, I draw a segment whose length is exactly the, um, the, the, the symplectic volume of sigma, of my surface sigma, okay? Now, what are these four dimensional manifolds? 
So this is the edge E1, yeah, that was this that lived in this in, in the, the two-dimensional Lie algebra. And what I do, so this picture, so you should really have in mind a toric picture, yeah. So take, as I was telling uh, Anton, a three-dimensional that's on polytope and you project it down to a two-dimensional. So you take, sorry, you take a three-dimensional that's on polytope, which is the product of a two-dimensional that's on polytope times P1, so times a segment. And so what are these four-dimensional spaces? Well, if you take the two-dimensional faces that are vertical, so they have one edge that is on the plane and the other edge, which is vertical, these two-dimensional faces, they are, again, the Zan polytopes, and they correspond to a certain symplectic submanifold of your three-dimensional symplectic toric manifold. And somehow the same thing happens here. You can think of these walls of the graph of the dosema heckman function as four-dimensional symplectic submanifolds, and they are exactly given by the pre-image of these edges here, okay? And it turns out that since this wall corresponding to M1 projects exactly to alpha one, it turns out that the normal bundle to sigma in MI is exactly the line NI, the line bundle NI, on which the torus is acting with weight alpha I, okay? I know this is a lot of notation, but if you are confused, you should just think about the toric picture and just take, you know, a two-dimensional del Zampolito cross, cross a segment. Okay, so now what do we know about how the doisenma heckman function changes in a neighborhood of, so suppose, so we take this four-dimensional symplectic manifold with an S1 action. So the image of the moment map isn't just going to be a segment, I call it BV prime. How does this function look like if we restrict it to a neighborhood of V. On the left, I would just have zero because I don't have reduced spaces. So I just want to understand what happens on the right. And what happens on the right is that, so since these spaces are complexity one spaces, it turns out that the doisenma heckman function is a piecewise polynomial of degree one, at most one. And so, so here you see the dependence on X is, is linear. And it starts just like the volume of the reduced space of sigma. And then the constant that gives you the slope is minus the C1 of the normal of the line bundle Ni evaluated on sigma. Okay. Uh, Sylvia? Yeah. So do I understand correctly? This is some kind of instance of the Dustermatt Heckman theorem, right? Sure. Yes, of course. No, this comes from. This is not ours. Eh? This is not. No, just, 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 just to. Yes, 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 yes. Exactly. It's an application, if you want, of the Dosenma Heckman theorem uh, to this very simple case, right? So you have complexity one. So you you have just a piecewise linear polynomial, and uh, and it's fairly easy to see from their proof that this is what it must be. Yeah. And. Okay, so now what do we know? So now we know that the doisenma Heckman function attains its minimum at the vertex V, okay? So which implies that the evaluation of the first class of Ni on sigma must always be less than or equal than zero. For all these nor normal bundles and I, there is a mistake here, it should be N minus one, right? And now we are essentially done. Because now you consider, now you remember. So until now, I did not use the positivity at all. But now you remember the positivity. And actually, what we need is not really this very strong condition. It's a much weaker condition, which is this one. So what you just need is that the first chain class evaluated at the fixed surfaces that happen in the pre-image of the vertices is positive. That's all you need which is weaker, I believe, in general, than these other strong condition. And once you know this, you are done because now you know that the first chain class of the tangent bundle of the manifold restricted to sigma, evaluated on sigma, this must be something positive. But now on the right-hand side, 
you will see that we just observe that all these evaluations must be less than or equal than zero. So this must be less than or equal than zero. So this better be positive, right? And so the only case is that sigma is just a two sphere. And now I would like to you to observe that um, this also tells us a little more about how this doisen heckman graph looks like in a neighborhood of its minimum. Because, well, this is positive, but it cannot be too positive. Yeah, it can be at most two. So that means that this big sum here is, a, is either um, zero or minus one. In which case, so if all these, um, if all these terms are zero, then it means that your doisen heckman function really starts flat, right? Or you can have just one of them, just one normal bundle that such a way, in such a way that um, the slope uh, of, this, of this line is given by one, one because there is a minus sign here, right? So it, it really... Sylvia, sorry, like I not only I ask a lot of questions, but they become more and more silly. No, no, no. By now, by, by now I forgot what we were proving. We were proving sigma equal to S2, right? Yes, Did yes. Okay, because when you said now we are almost done and I realized I, I don't know what this ah, means. Ah, sure, sure. No, you're right. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. So the, the whole point, really the key result that implies the simply connectedness was the fact that all these fixed surfaces, they were spheres, right? And, uh, and this comes from the positivity. This really comes from the positivity. And this is the proof. So the only trick is really to consider the surface sigma in such a way that the image of sigma through the moment map realizes the minimum of the doisenma heckman function. That's all that there is. And for the other results, um, so I, need to, I still need to prove that the tau genus is one and that the odd Betty numbers vanish. So the fact that the tau genus is one follows from the following. So I need to very briefly introduce the Hirzebrook genus. So the Hirzebrook genus was introduced by Hirzebrook and it was not defined like this. It was defined as a polynomial in Y whose coefficients tell you what the Euler characteristic of the Dolbeau complex in each degree is, okay? But then he shows in his book uh, manifolds and modular forms um, that um, if, you if you apply the Atiyah Singer theorem and you manipulate the terms appearing there a little bit, then this agrees with the genus associated to the following generating function. Whatever this means. Now, I don't want to go too much into the details, but what I want to say is that for an almost complex manifold, these genera defined associated to generating functions are well defined. They just depend on churn classes. And so that's the way you define it for symplectic manifold. This is what I wanted to say. And the top genus is just the evaluation of this polynomial in Y, which somehow you get from this generating function at Y equal to zero. And now we're almost done because whenever you have an S1 action, um, there is a localization theorem for the Hirzebrook genus. In the same spirit, so this, this, this genus can also be expressed like the coefficients of y are integrals of some churn classes. And all of these churn classes, they can be extended to be, to live in the equivalent cohomology ring. And, and you have there, you have localization theorems. So it's not so surprising that there is a localization theorem for the Hirzebrook genus, which looks like this. So it says that if you consider all the connected components of the fixed point set, this F1, Fn, if you consider the Hirzebrook genus of these components, which may be much easier to compute, then to get the Hirzebrook genus of the whole manifold, you just need to get this alternating sum, okay? Uh, again, just a very stupid question, the expression for Hirzebrook genus, it, it kind of superficially looks linear in Y. Ah, um, no. So you mean from here? Yes. So no, uh, so th this is really the generating function. So what you need to do is the following. Yes. So treat Y as a, like, I mean, you can also put Y equal to zero, okay? It's, yeah. it's not, uh, so let's just consider the top genus. So the generating function for the top genus would be X divided by one minus E to the minus X. Yes. Um, 
but what does it mean? It means that to compute it, what you need to do is to, is to take a Taylor expansion at zero of this function, okay? And you will have lots of Bernoulli numbers. Mm -hmm. And now you consider, and now if the manifold is complex dimension N, what you need to consider, so call this expansion F of X. So then you need to consider F of X1 times F of X2 times dot, 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 F of XN. So this product will be some infinite series whose terms are- Yeah, yeah uh, that, 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 that I understand, but still Y appears only once as a linear function, just, just, and then down there you have chi Y of M is some kind of uh, sum where minus Y is to the power D. Yes, I, I, because okay. when you take the products of this function, so if you define f of x to be this generating function, if you take f of x1 times f of x2 times f of xn, and you expand it, right? Once you take the products and you expand it, the, 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 the you will have coefficients of, so you will have some symmetric polynomials in the xi's times y to the k. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right? And um, so, uh, I mean, it needs a little, so the, the fact that the, uh, so the, the right coefficients that will pop up will be then the, so you need to then integrate the churn classes. So you need to rewrite all these symmetric coefficients, right? In terms of, of churn classes, interpreting the churn classes as the elementary symmetric polynomial but the coefficients of y, it's not always linear. You will have different. Um, so, I mean, it, it really needs to be worked out to, to see it clearly, but it comes from, from this expansion. So it's always, it turns out that it is always a polynomial in y of the degree of, of degree equal to the complex dimension of the manifold, okay? And right. And yes, yeah, so, so then you have these other expression for the Hirzebrook genus and where this DJ is the number of negative weights in the normal bundle to the fixed component FJ. By negative weights, I mean that here we have an S1 action. So the dual of the Lie algebra, the Lie algebra is just R and you can set notations correctly in such a way that uh, so that, that all of this makes sense and there is not a sign um, mistake, but the weights, they are just going to be integers, right? And then you are done, we are done, because if the action is Hamiltonian, then there is going to be for sure a J such that the FJ is a minimum of the moment map, and which means that the DJ is equal to zero, which says, in other words, that the Todd genus is going to be the Todd genus of the component that realizes the minimum of the moment map, right? And so now you say, okay, but we had a T action. How do I pass to an S1 action? Well, you just take a generic subcircle in such a way that the fixed points are the same as the torus fixed points. And this can be done because M is compact. And then the theorem that I just showed you, the one that said that all the fixed surfaces are all spheres, tell you that the minimum of the moment map well, is either a point or a sphere. And then, as I said before, the Todd genus of M is the Todd genus of the fixed component realizes the minimum. And so it is one because the Todd genus of a point and the Todd genus of the sphere are equal to one, okay? And, and then we have the vanishing of the odd Betty numbers and this follows from, it follows from the perfection of the Morse function, which tells you that the cohomology as a vector space splits into the direct sum of these easier, if you want, cohomology groups. And so now the fixed components are only points or spheres, so they don't have odd cohomology. And so there you go. So I think in fact that this is it. Maybe I was a little fast, which makes me worried, but um, I am very open to questions. Well, thank, thank you, you. Sylvia. So uh, thank you. Of course, we had this culture at this junior Poisson, right? We should find the appropriate signs.
for clapping, but I still don't know where it is. So, uh, on the of your screen, there are reactions. <laughs> okay, so uh, please, questions or comments. You can either raise your hands or unmute yourself and ask directly. Sorry, let me take the uh, charger. I will take the charger and uh, I, I am with you. I hear you, but I just need to take and hide again in the bedroom. Now, but in the meantime, when you're thinking about your questions or comments, uh, okay, I, I can ask uh, again a somewhat stupid question. Now, this, this was a very beautiful story of complexity one. Yes. So, I mean, uh, what happens, like complexity two, is it like already hopeless or what, uh, what, what, what's going to happen? Like, uh, is it some, uh, some conclusions survive or one can approach it or that complexity two is already like infinite complexity? Uh, I think complexity two is really tough. For instance, uh, in dimension four, complexity two means no symmetries at all. Right, and the um, and the theorem that Macduff uh, has based on work of Gromov and Taubes, it really uses heavily, you know, heavy tools in symplectic topology like uh, geolomorphic curves and things like that. So I think um, so. Maybe that direction is not really. Can you hear the baby crying? Maybe I will close the window. Just sorry. <laughs> Give me a sec. <clears throat> Yeah, so um, maybe that direction is a little tough, but maybe what, uh, actually, I can give myself a question. <laughs> I prepared a possible question. I am terrible. So this, this is a possible question. <laughs> so somehow the, um, the analysis that we are doing is kind of suggesting that in every dimension, there are only finitely many isomorphism classes of these monotone complexity one spaces, which resembles what happens in the toric category, because there are only finitely many isomorphism classes of funnel varieties, toric funnel varieties in every fixed dimension. And it seems that this category does not behave that differently. And the, 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 the evidence, the semi-evidence semi that we have for this is that, um, so we can prove this uh, nice result. Okay, so he just came. So the, the nice result is that if you have this monotone, so now by monotone, rescale the symplectic form in such a way that the class is equal to the first chunk class, okay? Complexity one space, then the image of the moment map, which is always an n minus one dimensional polytope is in fact an n minus one dimension, uh, n minus one dimensional reflexive polytope. So, and we know that there are only finitely many reflexive polytopes in each dimension. So the, the thing is that it seems that one can only build, so this is what we are, trying to prove. So the feeling that we have based on what we are working out now is that over each of these n minus one dimensional reflexive polytope, there can be only finitely many possibilities for the graph of the Deusserman Heckman function. And then from there, we will try to use, if this is true, we are on a good path to prove that the answer to this question is yes. So this is, this is like a potential generalization that sounds really interesting because I think these spaces are really, um, you know, sort of the next easiest generalization of symplectic toric manifolds somehow. Okay. So Silvia, thank you for asking your own question, but that's, that's very, very nice. Uh, any, uh, any questions from the audience? Can I have a question? Uh, towards the end of the proof, uh, when you did this um, discussion with the Hillsborough genus, I didn't quite understand why you introduce 
I mean, isn't there a result um, that the uh, tau genus of a Hamiltonian T-space equals the tau genus of its symplectic quotients? Um, that be due to a shortcut? Ah, it could be. I don't, I don't, I didn't know this. I don't know this theorem, so. Well, it's, it's basically like, like a version of quantization cumulative reduction. If you look yeah, at the zero, sure. it's a power of a pre-quantum line bundle. So actually it holds true, even if it's not pre-quantizable. It's, 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 it's like one of these quantization commits with reduction results yes. where the line bundle is just the trivial line bundle. Right, 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 right. Yes, that's a good point. Yes, thanks. Uh, you're right. Uh, we didn't think of it in these terms, but uh, yeah. Okay, um, more questions or comments? Yeah, Sylvia, I had a question. Yeah, Hi. Sure. Hi. Um, just, just a comment you made earlier, uh, and I'm not sure I can quite remember what it was, but something about how the Dastard Heckman uh, function limits to the to the edges. Did you say uh, you didn't know how it behaved, or um, what? On the what? edges. Yeah, on the edges, or as it goes to the vertex, because Anton asked the question about the. The regular part is okay, but, but as you go to the singular part. But you see, um, in a neighborhood of, um, yeah, so in a neighborhood of my uh, symplectic surface, I am working just, I, I, I just need to work on these four dimensional Hamiltonian S1 spaces, right? And now what could go wrong, I mean, the, the singularity that you may encounter in this complexity one spaces. So you have your Hamiltonian as one space. And while the singularities in this case are not that bad, yeah. right? Because you may have really at the worst a symplectic orbifold. Yeah. Yeah. And, and even in this case, um, that formula holds. So it's not, so the, the problem I think that Anton was raising is when you, is, is that this, this formula that I wrote here does not hold if you, if, if your reduced space is really horrible, right? It's like a stratified space. Um, okay. Yeah, but, but in, in the four dimensional case, complexity one, nothing too bad can happen. No? Yeah. 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 Okay, thanks. All right. More questions or comments? If not, but yeah, yeah, sure. Let me make a quick comment about your question, Anton, because I think elaborating slightly on what Sylvia said, um, ah. it I seems so in, in higher complexity. So this work of Lindsay and Panov kind of indicates that you can get some way with the type of techniques that Sylvia discussed today, but at some point you bump into a wall and you need harder machinery. So they use um, cyber witten theory at some point for their six dimensional case. So everything corroborating what Sylvia said, higher complexity, uh, let, let's say complexity two at least indicates that more sophisticated technology may be needed to tackle analogous questions. Mm -hmm. Right. But, but, but what you're saying is it's pro probably like, right? S S Silvia's answer was that uh, for complexity two, you need to understand four dimensional manifolds, right? Sim symplectic manifolds, which is complicated enough. And that, that's where you're using those techniques. Is, is it correct? In spirit, in, in spirit, you're right. I think, I think the, the, the gist of the fact that in, in, low, in complexity one, we can get away without, uh, we can get away with, no, with not using very complicated uh, machinery, or at least machinery that Sylvia and I understand. Let's put it this way, uh, at least Sylvia understands. Maybe I, I understand it to some degree, uh, is because in spirit, the reduced spaces are very small in dimension, the dimension two at, at worst. Uh, when you go to higher complexity, you can bump into monsters, which can be more complicated. Right, right, right. Yeah. So in fact, I think uh, that the work of uh, Lindsay and Panov gets complicated when 
when you have fixed components that are four dimensional, right? Because the, the dimension can be at most twice the complexity and the complexity in their case is, is, is two. And, and there, I think they needed, there was a lot of work to prove that these fixed components, four dimensional six components were simply connected. I think that that is where they have to use uh, heavy machinery. But in spirit is the same problem. I mean, it, it is still reduces as, as you guys are saying to understanding four dimensional symplectic manifolds, either themselves, because there is no symmetry in dimension four or as reduced spaces. Okay. Yeah. More questions or comments, please. Uh, so if not, uh, Silvia, thanks again. Thank you. So uh, next week we'll have uh, Jiang Hua Lu from Hong Kong at Global Poisson. Well, thank you for coming and uh, see you next week. Okay. Bye bye then. Thank you again for having me. Thank you, Sylvia. Bye. Bye bye. Bye. Well, and thank you, nice.